Well, pop, 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 pop. I finally got on here. It's nine o'clock coffee. Facebook kept crashing on my phone this morning. Facebook uh, online, very frustrating. Because I did a test like 15 minutes before and it still messed up. So, do it again. Pop, 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 pop. It's nine o'clock coffee morning guys it's the 17th of march happy irish cultural appropriation day i was just kidding so hey happy saint patrick's day uh coming up later cornucopia saints preservus borax the magnificent doctor my eyes a rabbit hole life before the flood cowboy coffee verbal judo and startling starlings i got my coffee going here it's black i want to do the bulletproof coffee but i'm trying to do the center minute fasting which keeps me from having um bulletproof coffee so uh, Check by later for uh, links in the description after the stream is over. It's a uh, stream about stuff I'm passionate about, honor and health, humor, science. You guys and God. I don't talk about politics and the stuff about God is at the end. So if that stuff triggers you, you can cut out. Cut out then. So uh, what today? Well, it's Dr. Patient Trust Day. It's funny that you have to have a day for that. Um, should you trust your doctors? Uh, I don't think any doctors aren't. I don't think doctors are wrong on purpose, but a lot of times they are wrong. They try to give the impression they're right all the time. But they're only human. My dad went to med school and dropped out because he thought he thought of doctors like they were, were gods and stuff. And when he got to med school, found out they weren't they were nothing but humans. He got very frustrated with it. He dropped out of med school, tried to get back in the next day. He wouldn't let him back in, of course, and. Uh, so you ended up being a pharmacist instead, but uh, you need to you need to trust the the great physician, in my opinion, which is Jesus. Now, that's all the God stuff about that. So it's also International Sports Car Day, uh, Maple Syrup Saturday. I don't know why it's just a Saturday, but they, they got a Saturday. Uh, maybe they got Maple Syrup Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and Fridays. I don't know. National Corn Dog Day. I've never had a corn dog. I've always wanted to have a corn dog, and for some reason, my whole life, I've avoided—not avoided, but never had the opportunity. I guess would be the best word to say, or best way to say it, to have a corn dog. So I wish we to have a corn dog. It's part of the cornucopia. It's also National Corn Beef Day and Cabbage Day. Uh, national uh, Corn Beef and Cabbage is not an Irish dish. It turns out. Uh, the beef, the Irish didn't eat beef back then. They just did uh, did milk uh, back when it was a celebration for St. Patrick's Day. Or one of their foods. They had uh, corned pork, not corned beef, and they switched over to corned beef uh, when they came to the United States. So it's a United States dish, not an Irish dish, and they picked it up from uh, the Jews since the Jews didn't eat pork. So that's I think that's kind of kind of interesting. And corn and corned beef. And cabbage day is salt. It's a coarse salt, which was used as a preserve. So saints preserve us. St. Patrick's Day is today. And it's also submarine day. And you may not think that submarine day would have anything to do with St. Patrick's Day, but you would be wrong. St. Patrick, this is another interesting tidbit, is not Irish or was not Irish. Uh, he was a Romano-British Christian uh, who lived in Ireland. Uh, he was also called the Apostle of Ireland. Uh, he's also the patron, one of the patron saints of Ireland, along with Brigitte of Kildare and Columba. He was a missionary in the second half of the fifth century in, in Ireland. He established Christianity in Ireland. And Christianity before St. Patrick was there in spots and stuff, but he was the one that was given credit for actually establishing uh, Christianity as uh, the, the main religion in, in Ireland. He converted a bunch of Celtic polytheists. Celtics, Celtics are kind of a, not much known about them or there's not much talked about them. I tried doing some research on them. Uh, the the uh, 
Celtic uh, priests were called Druids. I thought that, I thought Celtics and Druids were the same thing, but it's just the Druid. The Druids were the uh, the intel intelligentsia of the Celtics, the the, uh, the priests and stuff. I guess they're called priests, but they 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 practiced polytheism, which is uh, belief in many gods, and they also did a lot of human sacrificing. So Christianity. Had, uh, stopped the human sacrificing over there. He, at 16, he was enslaved by Irish pirates who kidnapped him from his home in Britain. And he spent six years living uh, living with the pirates and taking care of the animals. And he, he escaped and went back to, to Britain and got his uh, degree in, in uh, well, became a clergyman, however that happened. And then he returned to Northern and Western Ireland Became a bishop later, so he got demoted from being a missionary. It's a, it's a joke, kind of, because missionary. You know, we don't you don't see really many apostles around today because the word apostle means sent out, and the people we send out are missionaries. So you really can say missionaries are apostles. So apostles, in a religious sense, are thought of as greater than bishops. So therefore. If he was a missionary and then became a bishop, it's a demotion. Little is known about the places where he worked by the seventh century. By the seventh century, he became a patron saint of Ireland. Seventeenth uh, of March was the date of his death. It is celebrated inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday. Therefore, it is cultural appropriation. <coughs> if you're not religious, if you're religious, you're all right. <coughs> The shamrock uh, was a, uh, a clover that um, St. Patrick used to describe the Trinity and how it worked. How uh, three in one. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's also Submarine Day, of course, and Submarine Day takes place on uh, March the 17th, 2018. Submarine, Submarine Day celebrates the day that John Philip Holland, an Irish engineer, first successfully demonstrated his submarine called the Holland Sixth on St. Patrick's Day, 1898. So he's an Irishman who did it on St. Patrick's Day, his uh, demonstration. <clears throat> John, John, uh, well, where, where am I? Uh, see, first made, uh, in 1898, first made the successful uh, attempt to submerge and run which impre the, uh, the submarine which impressed observers of the U.S. Department, U.S. Navy Department, John Philip Holland designed submarines that for the first time made use of the internal combustion engines on the surface and electric battery power submerged. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, recommended to buy the Holland the sixth. Several months later, it was the Navy's first submarine, which was na later named the USS Holland, SS-1. And by the way, the National Submarine Day, which commemorates the purchase of the USS Holland, takes place one month later in April. And that's the rest of the story. Well, what's going on? Uh, Dr. My Eyes. No, really, my eyes. I mean, well, it's, there's going to be a lot about eyes in here, but my eyes have been giving me trouble uh, for about the past year, kind of. Uh, gotten kind of kind of blurry it's almost like the uh distance between my pupils have changed because my glasses don't quite work right the uh progressive lenses and you got to get that pupillary distance thing just right and i order my own glasses online so i have to do the pupillary distance but it's been it's been right so far but i noticed that if i close my eyes and move the lens around i can see clearer one day we'll be without these glasses, and that's going to be a good thing. Uh, I've also been uh, steeped in conspiracies the past week for some reason. I guess because of UFOs and the fact that a lot of the stuff that we suspect that the Russians were doing in our country has been happening in our country in the past and in the present. Uh, there's been some hacking into our systems. Um... I also saw the uh, Three Billboards movie for the first time. really liked that last night. I um, watched that with my family. And also reminded me of corned beef. Uh, Joel, Joel made corned beef for us a couple of years back, and it's a little difficult to make, and it didn't taste quite like what I wanted it to taste like. I think it has too much cardamom pods in it, but there's going to be a recipe down below on how to make corned beef. 
a little bit of visual work of the perpetual waterfall this is a uh, optical illusion youtube it looks like water's running uphill and call, causing a uh, water wheel to spin uh, which is kind of interesting doing a lot of work last week man i, I must work 60 hours last week and i gotta work pretty much all afternoon today once we get through with this thing uh, not going on work wise i saw a video on late night joke writing which i thought was rather interesting on how to write a joke basically you take two things that are unrelated let's say like but but are in the news for instance donald let's say, just say donald trump and then down in florida at uh, uh walt disney world they did a animatronic donald <coughs> well anyway you watch the video I don't think I'm going to do a very good descri job describing it. Watch the video. It's pretty funny. Pretty fun, too. I think I'm going to try it as a hobby to, to write write jokes using that technique. Uh, Startling Starlings. I saw this video on Starlings that you know, they fly in a pattern, uh, which I find very interesting. It's kind of like schools of fish, but with but with birds. And a more, it, makes, it, it has a, a spiritual component to me because I'm wondering how in the world that all these birds know how to fly like that it's, it's so coordinated and i'm thinking there must be some kind of like telepathy or some kind of spiritual connection between all those birds but anyway watch this very memorized mesmerizing uh, uh video on starlings startling starlings is what i call it oh the mars race too the russians have announced that they're going to mars and they're going to get there on the by the uh 2019 which is just like a year away The article I said saw it and wasn't clear on whether they were doing it as uh, you know sending human explorers or not. I think Elon Musk is talking about sending somebody in 2020, and he says he's going to have his spaceship that will take astronauts to Mars, which is the spaceship supposed to be pretty big. It's supposed to I think hold a hundred people. So and he's going to be test launching that. Uh, next year in 2019, he says. So, so the race for Mars is on with the Russians and Americans are on trying to get there. I guess China's trying. I'm not sure about that. But in, inside America, we got a couple of place people that are trying to get there. We got uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX trying to get there, and you got NASA trying to get there. So it's a race for Mars. It kind of reminds me of uh, the Gold Rush. So it's the Mars race. I had this vi this video. Uh, that I was going to play as a background. It was supposed to be a video of Mars through these windows, like you're on Mars. But I imagine y'all would get bored of that pretty quick. I'm looking out at our orange-colored or red-colored desert, I don't know who in the world would want to go to Mars because it's, the gravity. I just can't imagine going somewhere where you're going to live the rest of your life and you're going to be too light. You're going to be a lot way a lot less than you weigh now. The only thing you're going to be able to look out on is red nothingness. And uh, and the odds of dying, even Elon Musk said the odds are you're going to die. Now, why, who would want to do that? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe if you're terminally ill. I don't get it. But anyway, so that's what went. They blinded me with science. Uh, below is going to be uh, some videos of some stuff that's kind of interesting about science. One of them is not really so much science as, well, it is some science, but it's seven conspiracies that were true. You know, I was tell, telling you how I was into conspiracies last week. We're running into a lot of them and thinking about conspiracies. So, seven conspiracies that were true. Also, weird fossils. There are these uh, fossils out there. They, they're legit. They, you can see them all, all kinds of places and articles and things like that, these, the, these that you're going to see. And uh, like a hammer that was found in a million-year-old rock down in Texas. And uh, I mean, One was mentioned last week where they had a shoe print on top of a trilobite. <clears throat> but there's a bunch of other, other very odd fossils that have been found. So there's going to be a video on that, too. So that's science. In case you missed it, uh, the fugitive 
And this, I, I, you know, I, I was doing these this morning. I, I came up with them yesterday and I was doing them this morning. And while I was doing them, I was realizing, you know, I've done these in case you missed it. A couple of these movies before. So my apologies on that. But The Fugitive came up because I was thinking of St. Patrick's Day. And there's a, a St. Patrick's Day parade in The Fugitive uh, as part of the, part of the uh, 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 plot line. So, so I got the fugitive with Harrison Ford, Tommy Lee Jones, who got his start as an A act, A list actor in this movie. Uh, as a matter of fact, he did such a good job in this movie. He did the U.S. Marshals sequel, which was not a bad movie. It was just a little bit of a downer since a, one of the good characters got knocked off. Is that TV too bright? No, I guess it's all right. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, Seal Award, and one of our family favorites, Nick Searcy. Uh, Nick Searcy was in um, the three billboards of uh, Eba, Eben, Missouri. That was filmed in North Carolina, by the way, and up in Asheville. That was interesting. It reminded me of the Crimes of the Heart movie, which was filmed down in Southport. And I think the one down in Southport, or Crimes of the Heart, was supposed to be either in Missouri or Mississippi. So it was kind of interesting they used North Carolina to film uh, uh, film movies that are in locations other than North Carolina. I don't even know why I couldn't have been in North Carolina. So anyway, <clears throat> check that out, The Fugitive. Conspiracy Theory, this is another one that I, I think I've recommended recently. Um, it stars Mel Gibson, Julia Roberts, and Patrick Patrick Stewart. It's, it's a, I think it's a movie to, as a tribute to Mel's dad, who is a conspiracy theorist. He, uh, what's his name? Starts with an H. Yeah, can't remember. Uh, a friend of mine knows him and talks to him on the phone if he's still alive. I don't know if he's still alive now or not. But he said a friend of mine is a conspiracy theorist. But this conspiracy, if you listen to the conspiracy theories at the beginning of the movie, those are legitimate conspiracy theories that uh, Mel Gibson is, is espousing at the beginning and throughout the movie, really. When you listen to this trailer, pay attention to the narrator. He's the one that goes, in a world, you know, and then it's kind of an old, he's passed on now, but it was, it, it was a real popular kind of narration for trailers back in the 80s, I think up until the 90s, but they, it was so popular they did the movie. So as a, a, a uh, an apology, part of an apology is I'm giving you this movie called In a World, which is a little known movie, which is I think is a really good movie. And it's got some rude spots in it, so you don't, might want to be careful about showing it to your kids. But it's actually got some movie narrators uh, or movie trailer narrators in this movie. Uh, but it's basically about uh, um, a woman who struggles to be a movie trailer voice and it, I thought it was a, a, a four and a half star movie so it's but it's pretty independent it stars uh, Lake Bell the other guys I don't recognize except for Ron Swan the guy that plays Ron Swanson I can't remember his name should have got that guy but he's Ron Swanson was the guy that played in Parks and Rec he played the conservative character that was in there uh, now I'm not talking about politics but it, it, but I'm, I am conservative, and one of the big things that got me into conservatism, <laughs> this is going to be so strange to you guys, was watching things like All in the Family, which was supposed to make fun of conservatives, and then Family Ties, which had the guy that played in Back to the Future, can't remember his name now, a little kid, kid, and we played the young guy in Back to the Future. <clears throat> he played a conservative in there, and... And they were making fun of conservatives, but I was going, yeah, that's right. What the guy's saying is right. So they ended up making me a conservative because I was agreeing with them. Uh, well, it's the same thing with, with, with Ron Swanson. I was listening to Ron Swanson on the Parks, Parks and Rec, and that made me want to be more and more of a conservative. I was going, yeah, he's right. It's kind of interesting. St. Vincent is the next movie. Bill Murray stars Bill Murray, Melissa McCarthy, Naomi Watts, and Jaden Lieberher. Lieberher. And then the last one, uh, which was brought on, and I think I might have mentioned this one too in the past, and I apologize if I have, but it's still a good movie. 
If you haven't watched it, give it a watch. It's The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and they got a sequence in there, or they got a scene in there that had to do with the starlings flying all around. That's what made me think of it. Stars Ben Stiller, who also directed Kristen Wiig. Wieg. I, I used to call her Kristen Wiig. I saw her being interviewed, and they called her something Wieg or Wieg. Wieg. I can't remember now. But you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Shirley MacLaine, Adam Scott, and Sean Penn. I like all these actors. They're so good. I mean, Sean Penn and I are on the opposite sides of politics, but man, he is a good actor. I really like the way, uh, the, the job he did in this, this particular movie. On a different hack, cornucopia. Well, a lot of this is cornucopia, and all that really means is it's got has something to do with corn. Uh, if you got chili and it's thin, you know, you're supposed to use this like a mesa flour, or it turns out you can take, you, you want to make it thick, right? So the, it turns out there's a way you can make it thick by using, using corn chips. When you take a bag of corn chips, our main, one of our main, or my wife's main problems, I, I agree with her though, that when we get a bag of corn chips, the crumbs, we end up with a lot of crumbs and it's very tempting to get them thrown away. But let me tell you what we do with them. Well, what we're going to start doing with them is the chili. If you grind them up, you can use them as a thickener for chili. It works really good in place of mesa. Uh, and a lot of chili snobs will frown on it, but it's supposed to be pretty good. So you can give that a try if you need to thicken your chili. If your chips are stale, now when I, when I say stale, I don't mean rancid, because there's two different things. Stale is they taste fine, but they're just very bendy and they're not very crunchy. You can freshen them up by putting them in the oven and putting it on like uh, 200 degrees or something like that for a half an hour. They're not gonna burn, they're just gonna, it's just gonna get the moisture out of them and they'll be nice and crunchy. Also, you can take the uh, crumbs if you don't want to do it with a chili and you can make a casserole dish. And I, my wife used to do this. I don't know why she didn't do it anymore since she complains about crumbs, but I'll have to ask her. And she's got a recipe for a pretty good casserole, Mexican casserole, casserole dish that uses the, the crumb chips. Cowboy coffee. Now, if you guys ever find yourself needing to make some coffee and you haven't got a coffee pot, you don't have a filter, you don't have anything, all you have is a pot some beans and some water then you can make cowboy coffee which you are going to have to grind the coffee but most people have ground coffee anyway but i like to grind mine in the morning but you know if you've got ground coffee and you got some water and you got a pot you can have yourself some coffee and uh, there'll be a a video on how how you can make yourself some cowboy coffee without a filter and and even get the acid out so it doesn't bother your stomach so check that out Also, there's going to be a video on this on how you can do these eye exercises so you can uh, get rid of your glasses. I got a friend who doesn't work. He's uh, about 10 years older than me, and he's had failing eyesight, but he's always done these eye exercises, and consequently, he doesn't. He still doesn't wear glasses. Uh, so check these eye exercises out. Also, there's this stuff called Armor Etch. If you ever have glasses that have that film, I don't think these do. I used to get glasses that would have the anti-reflective thing, but you can't really I see those little dots there, but... I can't remember if I got that anti-reflective stuff on these or not. But the main thing that I don't like about the reflective problem stuff is that uh, they usually, it usually gets worn off before my lenses start scratching or before I'm ready for new glasses. But they look stupid with parts of the lenses uh, glaring and the other parts being protected by the protective film that's not protected anymore. So... There's a stuff called Armor Etch that's supposed to take that film off of your glasses. So if you got some of that film and you, you want to continue wearing your glasses because they're not that bad, but the film's take, been taken off or worn, part of it worn off, you can get the rest of it off with Armor Etch. And I was watching a video on how to clean your glasses, and I think the best... It was a fail video. I was just going, thanks for wasting my time, was what I said to the guy. He had went all over all these things to get rid of scratches on glasses, and none of them worked. Toothpaste did a really good job of cleaning them. Uh, but, and, I, and I've been to the fair where they use these wax pencils that got rid of them. I think what happens there is the wax actually gets in the crack and kind of covers, covers the scratches. So it doesn't, it's not a permanent thing. Imagine, I wonder what glue, Elmer's glue would do, like watered down Elmer's glue, if that would work. I don't know. Anyway, 
Verbal judo hacks. Um, you get into discussions with people, sometimes they can get you triggered. You know, and sometimes they try to trigger you, and they try to trap you. So these are there's a video on how to how to handle those kind of guys, <clears throat> and it does work. I even did it on Facebook. Somebody said something really nasty about me, and they were, they were just trying to be insulting. And instead of coming back, you know what you usually do is you burn them back. What a lot of people do anyway. You end up having this verbal fight on online, and I just simply said, "Why would you?" why would you say such an evil thing? You know, like, <laughs> it puts, makes them look at themselves going, hey man, I'm being evil. <laughs> and it does, it works. They, they realize they're being evil and then they backpedal. It's really interesting. But anyway, it's four magic phrases you can use to respond to anything. Also, one of the, the tricks is to answer questions with questions. And Jesus Christ did this in scripture a lot. If he was asked a question that he knew was a trap, then he would answer the question with a question. Which did, gave me an epiphany this morning. You know, who, what's the answer to the question, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Well, if you say yes, then it infers that you used to beat her. And if you say no, it infers that you're still beating her. So there's, there needs to be some other answers. Well, there was a third, a, a third answer that I used in the, my bifurcation example, how humans bifurcate, which means come up with two solutions and think that's all of them. Um, and w one of those answers was uh, to, don't, to not answer. Uh, but now I know there's a fourth answer. You just ask, ask the question back. So somebody says, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You go, have you? There's an answer. So answering a question with a question. Uh, there's going to be, if I can find it, there's a video of Ron Swanson on uh, Parks and Rec who... It has to be interviewed. He's being interviewed to try to find evidence against his employee. Can't remember her name right offhand. Oh, Leslie Nope. Leslie Nope. And he announces before he goes in to the audience that he's going to answer all the questions with questions, which I thought was pretty funny. Also up above is going to be a break break bad habits video on how to break bad habits, and then Borax the Magnificent. Did I say Borax the Magnificent up there? I thought I did, but I can't remember. Anyway, Borax the Magnificent. It was a Borax as a health product. I'm talking about the stuff you use in your laundry. How would you like to drink some of that every day? Well, it turns out it's supposed to be pretty good for you. There's also a bunch of other hacks that you can use for it, like uh, getting rid of ants. Yeah, you know, we use here a lot, and we already got ants. I can't believe it in the in the dining room, but uh, it's a pretty easy trick to get rid of them. So watch those videos on the video on that. What the tech in chroma? This has to do with green. You know, colorblind people have a hard time seeing green. A lot of them do, or red green people, so they don't get to enjoy St. Patrick's Day like we do. So there's a video about in chroma, in chroma glasses. So any of you guys that are watching that are colorblind, you can check this video out. Was, uh, and chroma seems to do a really good job on fixing you. Now, now, from what I understand, some of the fixing it does is permanent. It just kind of trains your mind to discern between the colors that you weren't able to before. Uh, but uh, we'll see about that. Oh, and this this one, this other one is really cool. I really want to try it. It's called the Third Thumb, and it's a, a video about uh, prosthetics and how you don't necessarily have to be missing uh, a part to actually use one. And this is about a a video about putting a third thumb, a, a prosthetic thumb, right here and being able to use it like a thumb, which is and it was really interesting. The, the expression of the, of the people that were trying this thing out, I thought was very interesting. But So the third, third thumb, there's also a, a video on nanoparticle eye drops. It turns out that there's um, an invention that's been made that has not nanoparticles, and apparently you'll be able to take your cell phone and get your eyes diagnosed and then use a device to etch, put etches on your cornea and then put eye drops in your eyes and then you won't have to wear glasses for like two or three months. You have to keep on repeating it from what I understand. But check that out. Also, a video on a camera that sees around a corner. And that's it with What's the Tech? YouTube this. Dinosaurs and man coexisting. Now, a lot of y'all, if you're hanging around and you're not biblically knowledgeable 
might not know that by, the scripture talks about dinosaurs. Of course, dinosaurs is a modern name, so you're not going to find the word dinosaur in scripture, but you will find dinosaurs in scripture. And you'll find them in Job, and I'll put some scripture verses on where those are so you can check them out. So you're going to find a lot of videos on evidence of man living with dinosaurs when you do this. Some of them, you know, I don't know how great they are, but I know a lot of them are good because there's lots of evidence out there that man did live with dinosaurs. So that will uh, that kind of supports the idea of young earth creation. Uh, and the Book of Dano. Okay, now this is really interesting. Book of Dano. I got this book. I said, well, what book should I use this morning? And I haven't, I haven't not touched this since I opened this page. I opened this page to this page. The name of the book is Through the Bible with J. Vernon McGee. It's a commentary on the Bible. It has the Bible verse in it. And then it has a, Bible, a series of Bible verses in it. And then it has an explanation of what that verse means. So this is excellent for a new Christian who wants to read the Bible but doesn't know what he's reading when he sees all these religious words and it just kind of goes in his ears. They have a, you know, it's kind of interesting. Christians have a lot of, uh, new Christians have the goal to read through the Bible in a year or something like that and they read through it and they don't know what they're reading so it doesn't do any really any good. So J. Vernon McGee, which goes through the Bible in five years on the radio, also has these books where you can read through the Bible as fast as you want and get the explanations. Now, a lot of times the explanations are right, but that's so what? But I opened this book this morning and right to this page, and I want you to look what was in there. This is a four-leaf clover on St. Patrick's Day that I'm sure Elizabeth Bass, my daughter, put in back a long time ago to flatten it. But one time, it might have been Sarah, though, because both Sarah and Lizzie used to go out in our yard and look for four-leaf clovers, and this is a four-leaf clover. How about that? Turn right to it on St. Patrick's Day in one of five books. This is the stuff where you know it's God. It's maybe the little small things that are God, but it's it's still interesting. You know, God's showing up <clears throat> in little small minor ways to show, yeah, I'm here. So that's the Book of Dano. Be a link to that over there, up there, down there, wherever. Okay, here we go with you don't mean it. You're a saint or an ain't? <clears throat> saint. A lot of uh, denominations think have a lot of um for for saints. You have to perform a certain number of miracles that have to be verified in order to be a saint. Well, scripture that's not what a saint is. A saint, all saint means in scripture is a holy one. And if you're a born-again Christian, you are a holy one. You're already set aside for God, which is what it means. It means set aside for a specific purpose. It has a, a gravity. Uh, it means separated to God on God's side. You're either on God's side or not. So if you're on God's side, you're a saint because you're a holy one. You're set apart to God. If you're not set apart to God, then you're an ain't. So you're either a saint or an ain't. Uh, well, the proofs that you can look at it is, well, think about the, the most worldly church in, mentioned in Scripture. Uh, if you th It was the Corinthians, I'll just tell you. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians was w written to the most worldly church known at the time of Paul. It's, they were just infantile Christians, basically. And it opens up addressing the letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And if you look at 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, you'll see, I didn't put that verse in there, but look it up. First, I'll put a link to it too. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16 and then Leviticus 11.45, For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy, set, which means set apart. The word applies to God because God himself is totally other, separate, separate, sacred, transcendent, reverend, and set apart from every created thing. And if you're a born-again Christian, so are you. 
So you're holy just as God is holy because God has made you holy. So it sounds a little, it kind of gets you on a religious nerve there, doesn't it? When you say something like that, like you're holy or I'm holy or I'm a saint. Yeah. So that's, you don't mean it. You're either a saint nor an ain't. Sermonette, Trinity explained. The Trinity is a modern word, but it's not a modern concept. Uh, I had a friend of mine who doesn't believe in the Trinity. He only believes in, I guess, God the Father. He doesn't believe Jesus is God, in other words. And, because he says, the word Trinity wasn't invented. We didn't come about until something like 1900. Like, well, it doesn't matter when the word came about. It's when the concept came about. He baptized people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's the Trinity. But uh, what is a Trinity? Well... Trinity, we're made like the Trinity, and that's, uh, so when I, people ask me how the Trinity works, because it's three three gods in one, what does that mean? I mean, that's kind of weird. Well, you're, you as a human being are three in one. I'm three in one. Uh, I got, you know, if I die, I get put in the ground. My body gets put in the ground, but my soul and spirit is not in the ground. So if you said, where is Chris Hargett? If you ask somebody, where is Chris Hargett after I die? Well, you'd have to be in what kind of context, you know. If you say, well, we got to dig up Chris Hargett. I said, well, he's buried, his, his, his body's over here. So you're talking about Chris Hargett, the body there. But if, say, it's, if you're talking to one of my loved ones who knows I'm a believer, and say, where's Chris Hargett? He said, well, he's, he's in heaven. He's not, you know, so isn't he in the ground? Well, no, that's his body. You know? So it's, it has a lot to do with uh, those three things, spirit, soul, and body. Now, to us, the body is the most important, and then the soul and the spirit, if we're fleshly, you know, because especially if you're somebody who doesn't believe there is a soul and spirit, that's all there is to you is your, your body and your brain. I heard, I heard that uh, that scientist that died last week was an atheist and didn't believe in life after death, so to him, he was just a body, and he, he said so. He said his brain was just a computer. <coughs> so he was just one thing. Now, Jesus, the God's the same way. Jesus represented God as the body. I mean, he had a soul and a, and a spirit. Well, it was the Holy Spirit he had, but and he had a soul, and the soul was basically a human soul, but he deferred to the Father. He only did what he saw the Father doing. So his body represented the body of God, and then the Father represented the soul of God, and then the Holy Spirit represents the Spirit of God. Now, unlike humans, they're all complete. Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit are all God, collectively and individually. They're, they're God. But to, just to explain what the Trinity is, they're three in one. It's three in one, just like a clover. It's got three leaves, and it's one. That's how St. Patrick described it. Of course, you got a four-leaf clover, and then you got yourself a Christian, because then you got Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then the Christian. <laughs> so, that is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and God, it's interesting that God, we, th we, th we use the phrases, those that know the phrases, spirit, soul, and body, we use the, the phrase body, soul, and spirit. Chris, what are you? Know, oh, body, soul, and spirit. Well, if you look at scripture, it's not listed that way. It's listed spirit, soul, and body. And that's because God puts the emphasis on what's true. He says that we are spirit. Those that are that know Jesus, that are know Him, are spirit, and we're a spirit that has a soul and has a body. Uh, now, if you're not born again, your spirit is dead. So, what are you? I don't know. Your body with a soul? I don't. I don't. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Hebrews four twelve. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. This is a scripture verse on where they use the word soul and spirit, because a lot of people think soul and spirit are the same thing, and they're not. And that's one proof right there. It's mentioned in two different places, soul and spirit. Uh, also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 through 24, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Sanctify means separate, you cut yourself away it's the word circumcise, basically. It means to circumcise you out of the world. Circumcise you out of the world. 
holy, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gee, I hope that happens. Faithful is he that calleth you, he also will do it. There's a prayer of faith right there by, by uh, Paul. Preserve us, he's going to preserve us blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, spirit, soul, and body. <sighs> Jump starting. Wow, way over. Oh, man, I'm way over. Jump starting. <sighs> Uh, one benefit of jump starting is the fact that you're you're cutting out whose faith you're using. <clears throat> if you see Dorbin, Torben uh, Sundergaards and, and any of the other people that <clears throat> take people out jump starting, when they pray for people, you don't really know whose faith is being used. If you look in Scripture, faith the faith that heals can either be from the person who's being healed. Or it can be from a loved one who's standing by, or it can be from the person that's actually doing the commanding. Uh, faith has to be there, but it doesn't have to be coming from the person that's doing the commanding. And in the case of a kickstarting, the faith of the people that are doing the kickstarting might be the ones that are actually doing the healing, not the people that are actually doing the talking. So one of the benefits of doing a jump start is you take the the uh, ex expert or the the person who's uh, got the expertise out of the picture for providing the faith. And now, if it's the person who's being prayed for might have the faith. You know, so the only time that you're really going to realize it's your faith is if you're praying for somebody who's a doubter, who's a, probably a non-believing doubter, or probably the easiest from what I understand. Uh, but anyway... Uh, faith, hope, and love are the important combinations for doing a jump start. You want to do the loving first. You, you get to know the person, talk to them, be concerned about them, you know, legitimately concerned about them. Your goal shouldn't be to heal the person, but to love on the person. While you're loving on the person, the hope that you can do something for them might rise up. And hope is, uh, hope is what you have to have first before you have the faith and you got the faith faith is the evidence that the thing you hope for is coming true so if you look at hebrews hebrews chapter 11 the first first verse there it says now faith is the substance for things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so you get you got the hope and you get ready to speak it in faith believing that what you want to speak is going to happen be convinced of it that's the faith, and then speak, which actually makes the faith work. And then you can ask the person to do something, like bend over. If you've got a back problem, ask him to bend over. If he has trouble walking, ask him to walk. You can also ask him to just go do something. Jesus lets go, go wash in the in the in the lake or the spirit. Go wash and you have your eyesight back, you know, so that there's an action that the person can do that would actually cause them to be uh, healed, also. Uh, where's the love, though, in, in Hebrews 11? One? I've heard a lot of people say that faith act works by love, but if you look in Hebrews 1, it doesn't say anything about love. So you can use faith to heal people without actually doing love, and it's, it's evidence in a lot of places that that's true. But, it's, but without love, you're just a clanging symbol, if you remember the scripture verse on that. So why do it without love? So do the loving first. Now, one reason that, oh, I wanted to uh, do these disclaimers ahead of time, because a lot of these guys know in this Jesus on the streets part, a lot of these guys know how to heal, but they're, uh, they're not, I don't think they're spiritually mature well, a lot of times. They, and the reason I know that is because a lot of times they take scripture verses out of context or give words meaning that, don't, that aren't there. It isn't there. But that doesn't keep them from healing because this, all this stuff is, does not have anything to do with maturity. It only has to do with you exercising your faith. You can be a born again Christian. You can be like an, you can be born again Christian an hour old and go out and heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. You can do all that stuff if you have the faith. So my disclaimer is, 
these people that I mentioned or show down here are not people that I necessar I'm necessarily uh, uh, agreeing with doctrinally. I'm just saying that these guys know what they're doing when it comes when it comes to teaching somebody how to heal in the name of Jesus. Uh, Torben Sundergaard is one of those guys. He believes that baptism is key to being born again. When there's not any it's, it's scripturally, that can be disproved pretty easily. But one reason he thinks it is because after he baptizes people, he uh, baptizes them in the Holy Spirit. After he baptizes them in the name of Jesus, he baptizes them in the Holy Spirit. And right after he baptizes them in the Holy Spirit, he cleans out any demons that are left in there. And, and that seems to be evidence to them that that's what's going on, but <clears throat> that it's part of the salvation experience. But it only is so, in my opinion, because that's what he has faith for. He has faith that that's going to happen. Just like they have faith that when they take out their their charges, their Padawan lear learners, that when they pray for the sick, the sick are going to get healed. They have faith for the person they're praying for, that are, that's doing the praying. So it's the same thing. And that... and. So much doctrine is created by having faith that your doctrine is correct. You have faith that your doctrine is correct, which causes something to happen, validating the fact that your doctrine is correct, when it's really just because you had faith that that doctrine is correct. And a, a site, excuse me, I've got to itch on my back. A site, John G. Lake, is an, an example of this. And you know, he was in the early 1900s. He believed that you could heal the sick and all that, but you had to be very holy. And I'm talking about in a religious sense. He would not let newspapers come into his house. He would only read scripture. He would read scripture, pray, uh, talk to you, and then repeat, and eat, and then repeat. That's the only thing he did so that he could heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead. So I, got, I think a lot of people got discouraged from actually learning how to do it because they thought they were going to have to be holy like that. And trying to be holy like that in the flesh is miserable. It's something that if you do it in the spirit, it's fine. But it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're doctrinally correct. It has to do with your faith. So it's really easy, if you're not careful, to start believing something that's not true, which is what why my motto for doing this kind of stuff is no rules just right, which is from the uh, Outback Steakhouse. There are some rules, of course, but the less rules, the better, in my opinion. So when you have a rule that Christians in church are harder to pray for to get well than non-believers outside the church, is that true, or is that just because you believe it's true? You know, or you, it just seems like that would be true, and that's why it doesn't work. You know, who knows? I mean, you keep on making these rules, and eventually you're going to work yourself into a box where everything has to be just right in order for you to pray. <clears throat> so that's the end of that. There's uh, going to be some videos down below of Torben uh, taking out some people that, and they are healing in, inside an hour. Uh, and then there's also a video on hands-on learning. Now, this is a, I don't like, typically like seeing this stuff done in church because it has such a, a religious feel to it. But there's going to be, just, just so you can see somebody else doing it, from Australia that's doing a hands-on lesson that's in, that's in church. He's actually healing somebody up front. Um, so check that out. Jesus on the streets. That was all jump-starting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Jesus on the streets. Some videos on people getting their eyes healed. Uh, not necessarily blind. A lot of people got rid of their glasses. And uh, was one of my pet projects. Get rid of my glasses. So check that out. And then the rabbit hole, life before the flood. Uh, and then this has to do with UFOs. You know, UFOs have been coming in a lot lately. And uh, I, my personal belief is that angels have been here on Earth and that they were physical be beings and they were involved with uh, human beings back before the flood. And I got a, I got a feeling this guy's stuff um, might be right on. Which is hard to say because this guy's a flat earther. <laughs> so you watch, you watch it and see what you think about it. But it does explain a lot. So, rabbit hole, life before the flood. Next week, overachievers, anonymous youth. What a concept! 
Face Palm Saturday Raisinets intro to, ver to versions. And that's it. So, Father, give us eyes to see, faith to see. Give us eyes to see the faith that you want us to see. Use us as you see us as sons of God. Or sinner if you're not born again. Because, uh, you know, if you're born again, you should be convinced that you're righteous. You know, I said this in front of some friends one time, and they gave me one of those eyes. You're righteous? Yeah, I am. I'm righteous. But it's not because of my, me. It's because of Jesus. You, know, you look at 1 Timothy. And in John 16, 8, it says, and, and when he comes, he will convict. This is the Holy Spirit he's talking about. He will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness and about judgment. Father, train us to be mindful of you all during the day, and we give you the glory. Help us to love on each other and bring, bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining me on Saturday night, Saturday morning, Saturday 9 o'clock coffee. Kind of punchy. <laughs>